<laughs> on top you does. <laughs> that's what's going to make you stay. Yeah. No. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing good. How about this stuff? The committee will come to order. Welcome and thank you for joining today's hearing entitled a review of USDA animal disease prevention and response efforts. After brief opening remarks, members will receive testimony from our witness today and then the hearing will be open to questions. It's an honor to share this first hearing of the House Agriculture Committee Subcommittee on Livestock, Dairy and Poultry in the 118th Congress. As a future nation Kansan, having grown up on our family's farming operation, I rode pens and doctored thousands of sick cattle at our preconditioning feed yard. I understand the grit, tenacity, and courage that it takes to make a living in agriculture and the burden and responsibility for feeding the world that comes along with it. Chairing this subcommittee is a privilege for me as I represent the big first district of Kansas, which produces more than $10 billion worth of livestock, dairy, poultry, and products like beef, milk, and eggs every year. That does not happen in a vacuum. It takes the entire animal agriculture chain to make that happen, and we see it all in the big first. From the producer to the feedlot and from the harvest facility to the distributor, every role is important in delivering protein in the market and to the consumer. Back in 1915, and I have a button here from uh, the convention that year, the Kansas Livestock Association was here on Capitol Hill advocating for producers around the exact same issues that we're looking at today. Packers, stockyards, and animal health. Foot and mouth disease was wreaking havoc at the time, and Kansas producers stepped up to the plate to make a difference and to fix problems. And here we are today, more than 100 years later, holding a hearing to review USD animal disease prevention and response efforts. Today's hearing is particularly timely as we're in the middle of the most devastating high path avian influenza outbreak on record, and African swine fever in the Dominican Republic and Haiti is dangerously close to our shores. Animal health issues don't always get the attention that they deserve, but as we've seen with past animal disease outbreaks, there are enormous economic consequences that extend well beyond the animal industry. The new Farm Bill must continue to address these risks to animal health while bolstering the long-term ability of U.S. animal agriculture to be competitive in the global marketplace and provides consumers around the world safe, wholesome, affordable food produced in a sustainable manner. Industry stakeholders and congressional leaders had the foresight to establish a three-tiered animal disease program with mandatory funding to ensure the sufficient development and the timely de deployment of all measures necessary to prevent, identify, and mitigate the catastrophic impacts that an animal disease outbreak would have on our country's food security, export markets, and overall economic stability. As we work to craft this next Farm Bill, we must have a comprehensive understanding of how these programs have been implemented. We look forward to feedback on the lessons learned, what's working, what should be reconsidered, and where additional investment may be required. With that, I'd now like to welcome the distinguished ranking member and the gentleman from California, Mr. Costa, for any real opening remarks that he would like to give. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh Mr. Chairman, uh, it's great to uh, be here with our subcommittee and we thank you uh, for your leadership and obviously, as you noted, uh, your own uh, personal uh, family history with, uh, with American agriculture uh, from the part of the country that you represent. Uh, I have a similar experience, a uh, third generation farmer uh, in California uh, and I'm honored to uh, represent uh, folks throughout the Great uh, San Joaquin Valley. Uh, we've had the chairman out here and part of the committee in February, and we thank him for coming out there, but he's been there many times. 
Uh, I happen to represent the uh, uh, most uh, productive uh, dairy county in, in the country, believe it or not, Tulare County, and the uh, highest citrus county in the nation, and uh, we do a lot of good things out there. But this morning's uh, hearing is important for the subcommittee's purpose because uh, our witnesses under Secretary Moffitt, who also is from California originally, uh, and uh, our uh, good doctor uh, have a good understanding of the challenges we face with uh, livestock, um, uh, poultry, and, and the other topics that are uh, of this subcommittee's jurisdiction. And while the livestock policy is typically addressed outside the Farm Bill, there are crucial programs, certainly in the last Farm Bill that we created that ensure our food system is secure. I'm interested to hear the witness's testimony on those programs. Because as I say always, food is a national security. Food is a national security, and I think all of my colleagues here agree with that. And the importance of maintaining American agriculture's productivity and its certainty uh, to continue to lead the world is so critical. Uh, no issue embodies a message to a greater extent, I think, than animal health programs. The inherent biosecurity measures in this world that we live in that is interconnected is critical. And therefore, protecting livestock operations in our country and having the tools to place to address outbreaks is critical. Uh, and therefore, our supply chain, which has been challenged here in recent years as a result of the pandemic and other factors, both internally throughout the country as well as externally in terms of our exports, uh, is uh, something that I think the entire Ag Committee is focused on. Um, we've all seen firsthand uh, how high Pathogenic avian flu has devastated uh, domestic poultry populations where depopulations have had to take place. Uh, it certainly has increased, as we know, the price of eggs. People say, how could eggs increase so much? Well, avian flu, uh, is, is, uh, I'm told, is a result of about 70% of the increase in, in egg prices. So we got to continue to refine and improve our approach to address animal disease. The USDA needs all the tools to guarantee a robust response. We want to thank them for their good work uh, during this outbreak, but previous outbreaks, and their containment efforts. Uh, obviously, it's critical, and that's the subject matter for today's hearing. There are certain aspects of animal disease that are difficult to contain, and the example is a primary driver of our current outbreak has been migrating wild bird species. Uh, that uh, interact between animal agriculture. It's just kind of the way things are, and it's inevitable, but uh, it's something that we have to do and, and be challenged to prepare for. So I'm looking forward to uh, talking to our witnesses and finding out these three no, uh, programs, uh, the Vaccine Bank, the National Animal Preparedness and Response Program, and the National Animal Health Laboratory Network have uh, uh, been able to uh, provide the foundation for preventing and preparing outbreaks. So I look forward to the testimony of the witnesses. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and for members of this subcommittee as we address the important issues that this subcommittee uh, faces. Thank you. Thank you, Rec Ranking Member Costa, and uh, thank you for your partnership as we look at these important issues. Next, I'd like to recognize Chairman Thompson for any opening remarks that he would like to make. Well, thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Thank you for all taking part in this, this hearing. Under Secretary Moffitt and Dr. Nago, thank you both for being here today. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chairman Mann, Ranking Member Costa, for holding this very timely and very important hearing. Uh, uh, from real-time disease response efforts to controlling potential disease vectors like the feral hog population to monitoring a growing number of imported dogs from ASF-affected countries and stopping illegal entry of meat and fruit products and byproducts, APHIS has a tremendous task in protecting the health of the U.S. animal population. Uh, I also want to say I've had some opportunities in my travels around the country to, uh, to spend some individual time with your uh, frontline APHIS uh, folks, and uh, they're great people. People. They're dedicated to what they do. Uh, I've had an opportunity to, to, uh, um, to have some individual, individual time with uh, whether it's preventing rabies uh, from coming uh, from Mexico or, or the fever tick uh, from crossing the border and, and coming into our cattle, and, or quite frankly, the feral hog program uh, uh, that, is, that is so important uh, because of the damage that, that they do. 
um, uh, their, their work and your work is much appreciated. Uh, so I was, uh, I was proud of Congress's uh, work in the, in the last Farm Bill to provide a historic investment in a suite of animal disease preparedness and response programs. And as we draft the next Farm Bill, it's imperative that we understand how these existing authorities and resources have been utilized. Uh, especially in the wake of high path avian influenza and the incoming threat of the African swine fever. We must ensure these and related programs are, are having the greatest possible impact. Um, uh, and, that's, and those are at the top, obviously get, those get more attention, but what you do each and every day, uh, as I mentioned, the rabies threat coming across the border, the, the fever tick, uh, there's just so much that most people are not familiar with and it's much appreciated you being on the front lines. Now I've all, uh, I, I hear all too often from folks back home and across the country about their ongoing struggles with the high path outbreak, which has not only reinforced my commitment to treating food security as national security. As we learned the hard way in 2014, 2015, biosecurity plays an enormous role in mitigating the spread of the disease and we want to ensure strong measures are in place across all production methods. That said, we also have to ensure these measures don't unduly burden the day-to-day -day operations of our dedicated producers. So I appreciate the department's continued collaboration with state officials and industry stakeholders towards an efficient yet pragmatic response based on the latest available science. I'd also be remiss if I didn't highlight CWD, chronic wasting disease, which has been a big problem in many states uh, for deer populations, including my home state of Pennsylvania for quite some time. Uh, in total, it's spread to uh, 29 other states across the country. Uh, last Congress, I was proud to work with Congressman Kind and, and my House and Senate colleagues to enact the Chronic Wasting Disease Research and Management Act. And I look forward to working with you and my colleagues on the Appropriations Committee to ensure that those programs continue to receive the attention and the resources that they deserve. And with that, I again want to thank our distinguished witnesses, for, not only for being here today, but for their important work day to day, uh, working to protect the health of our animal populations. And with that, I look forward to your testimony and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Great, thank you, Chairman Thompson. Uh, the chair would request that other members submit their opening statements for the record so the witness may begin her testimony and to ensure that there's ample time for questions. Our witness for today's hearing is USDA's Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs, Jenny Lester Moffitt. She's accompanied today by Dr. Alicia Nigel, who is the Associate Deputy Administrator for Veterinary Services at USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services. Undersecretary Lester Moffitt, thank you for joining us today. We will now proceed to your testimony. You will have five minutes. The timer in front of you will count down to zero, at which point your time has expired. Undersecretary Lester Moffitt, please begin when you are ready. Thank you, Chair Mann, Ranking Member Costa, Chair Thompson, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to testify today. As you mentioned, Chair Mann, I'm joined by Dr. Alicia Noggle, Associate Deputy Administrator for the Animal Plant Health Inspection Services Veterinary Services Program. She works closely with Dr. Rosemary Sifford, the U.S. Chief Veterinary Officer. Together, they lead a workforce of veterinarians and other personnel dedicated to protecting the health and marketability of American livestock. As Chair Thompson mentioned, every day APHIS employees are out on the field, on farms, at the borders, inspecting and conducting surveillance of animal diseases. They are working directly with individual farmers, ranchers, veterinarian states, and tribal officials. They share best practices about biosecurity and preparedness. They oversee imports and exports of animals and animal products to ensure continued safe trade, protecting existing and opening new markets for agricultural products here and abroad. Their efforts to protect these markets has greatly enhanced the new, been greatly enhanced by the new animal health programs Congress provided in the last Farm Bill. The new authorities and additional funding are working. We are better prepared today because of those programs. The 2018 Farm Bill gave us three interlocking programs. They work incredibly well together and allow us to form stronger partnerships with producers, states, veterinarians, and others. These programs, coupled with appropriations and the Secretary's ability to transfer funds from the Commodity Credit Corporation, help us respond and be prepared. 
All of us have a stake in keeping foreign animal diseases out of the country, and these tools help us work together. The National Animal Disease Preparedness and Response Program, or NADPREP as we call it, has allowed us to fund 180 different projects with our partners. We have funded projects that have increased our surveillance for significant animal diseases and that have enhanced our ability to standardize sample collection. NADPREP has let us fund training exercises and new methods for recovering from out disease outbreaks. Key is that it's not just us doing this important work, but also our partners and cooperators who bring their expertise in U.S. animal health as well. These projects fill important needs. They identify and close small gaps in our overall preparedness and response programs. We regularly say that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound in cure. By that standard, this program is worth its weight in gold. The other two programs of the Farm Bill authorities are also critically important. We have funded over $20 million worth of projects for the National Animal Health Laboratory Network. We know that speed is important with animal health emergencies, and having a broad network of laboratories to identify where disease is let us quickly eradicate it and reduce the spread. The third program, the National Animal v Vaccine Veterinary Countermeasures Bank, is um, help, we have know that we have kept foot and mouth disease out of the country for nearly a century, and we are confident that the system of overlapping safeguards that we have in place will continue to work. However, given the massive cost of an outbreak of foot and mouth disease would cause, having vaccine at the ready is a very prudent measure, and insurance policy should the worst occur. These programs have better prepared us for foreign animal diseases, but they're also building off of existing expertise of APHIS that APHIS has in preparing for and responding to disease, such as the outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza. We know that our methods in stamping out high path AI are working. In March 2023, we had just five cases of commercial in commercial facilities, when in March last year we saw 10 times that amount. We know how and where to look for high path AI. We know how to respond quickly so producers can get back to producing food, how to important biosecurity is, how to keep trade markets open as well. We also know from our partners at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that the currently circulating virus strain poses a low human health risk to the public. And if high path AI sur cases surge again, we continue with continued partnership with states and producers, we know what to do and we are ready. With respect to African swine fever, our efforts continue to keep this deadly virus offshore. We have enhanced inspections, increased our surveillance capabilities, and educated producers and veterinarians about the signs and risk of the virus. I remain confident that we can keep this disease away, but we are all prepared to respond to any, to any incursion, and the Farm Bill and the Farm Bill programs have helped us improve our readiness. Mr. Chairman, I, we always want to keep these foreign animal diseases out of our country, and these new tools that Congress has given us have enhanced our efforts. We are better prepared to detect you, to respond, and to eliminate foreign animal diseases because of them. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you for your important testimony this morning. At this time, members will be recognized for questions in order seniority, alternating between majority and minority members, and in order of arrival for those who join us after this hearing convened. You'll be recognized for five minutes, each in order to allow us to get as many questions in as possible. Uh, first, I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Under Secretary Moffitt, as I mentioned in my opening statement, the last Farm Bill included historic investments in animal health programs, including the National Animal Health Laboratory Network, the National Animal Disease Preparedness and Response Program, and the National Animal Vaccine and Veterinary Countermeasures Bank not to mention the work to solidify the National Bio and Agri-Defense Facility uh, that's currently being constructed and is almost complete in the Big First District of Kansas. Can you talk about how these Farm Bill programs are used to complement other programs and funding streams to bol bolster APHIS' ability to carry out one of its core missions, protecting the health of the U.S. animal population? Chairman, thank you so much for that question. I. Um, as, as I outlined in the, in the testimony, and as you just talked about, the three different programs interlocking together are very important. I come from production agriculture myself, and the importance of a farmer to be able to have many different tools is similar to our own APHIS animal disease preparedness response as well. To be able to have um, funding, to be able to do tabletop exercises, 
other exercises so that we are ready and prepared and to be able to respond to animal disease outbreaks, as well as, of course, the lab network and the extensive lab network throughout the country, and then, of course, um, the insurance policy through the vaccine bank. All of these things are important. And your question about how we supplement that with the existing resources, annual appropriations that APHIS and USDA receive writ large is a very important part of that. We have an incredible team at APHIS that Chair Thompson mentioned, and, um, and a lot of that funding comes through annual appropriations. The lab network, in fact, is also funded through annual appropriations as well. And then finally, I'll just emphasize when and should we have an animal disease outbreak like HiPath AI, um, it, the importance of being able to use CCC funding to be able to manage that outbreak is important as well. Ed, thank you. As we work to reauthorize these programs through this next farm bill, is there anything in particular that you would advise that this committee consider? You know, I think uh, one thing that is, I think, really important about the funding and the authority that was provided through those three different programs in the 2018 Farm Bill is the flexibility that is allowed there so that the, the, our staff and our team of animal health responders have that flexibility. I think that is such an important part. Of course, we, can continue, we will continue to work through the lab network. We'll continue to work um, in all of the different pieces of that. Uh, we also know that we have over 800 APHIS staff have, who have been deployed at least once in a six-month period or a six-week period, um, many multiple times. And so building up our workforce is a very important part of that as well. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, thank you. On January 19, 2023, APHIS proposed a rule that would require electronic identification or EID ear tags for purposes of animal disease traceability and as a requisite for official interstate movement of certain cattle and bison. While I understand the goals here, it will obviously come with added cost to producers in, in my district in Kansas and across the country. In the past, APHIS has provided free EID tags and financial assistance for related infrastructure to prepare for compliance efforts. Uh, with such a regulation. So I'm curious, what are the department's plans for mitigating the cost to producers and other entities like sale barns for compliance with this rule should it become final? Yes, thank you, Chairman, for recognizing the work that APHIS has done in the past in providing animal ear tags. Over 19 million ear tags have been distributed already by APHIS. Um, this rule right now is in, is in draft form. Her, I think we've received over a thousand public comments so far and, and the rule closes tomorrow and so we're still accepting public comments. We'll take those public comments as we will look at, as the team at APHIS looks at uh, drafting the final rule and taking into consideration impacts and, um, and, and opportunities for, for small producers, large producers and everyone in between. Um, should there be funding allowed um, and funding available, uh, we can continue to, to look at ways that um, we can distribute additional ear tags. We're also working with sale barns and auction barns in distributing um, and, and handing out uh, readers as well so that when animals come to, to auction, there's an ability to be able to identify them as well. Yeah, th thank you. I think we ought to remember what these regulation things mean to producers and uh, so I appreciate um, your comment. One last question. I'm also closely monitoring the Food and Drug Administration's proposed changes to longstanding labeling requirements for re-implanting of shorter acting growth implants for cattle. While I understand this is not a USDA issue, I do want to mention that USDA should be at the table when FDA is making decisions like these that would abruptly stop a common practice that could adversely impact the industry. How is USDA working with FDA on these proposed changes? Well, thank you for that question. USDA um, continuously works with FDA on a myriad of different issues where we, we share common ground, we share some common work, and um, we'd be happy to work with FDA on, on working mm -hmm. through this issue as well uh, so that the voices of, of agriculture and the perspective that USDA can bring are part of the decision for FDA. Thank you. Yeah, but please do, as this regulation will certainly negatively impact our cattle producers, and at the end, we'll you know, increase our, the cost of our food supply, um, you know, at a time of, of rising inflation. So thank you. Um, with that, I now recognize the uh, ranking member, the gentleman from California for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I get into my questions, I want to make a couple of observations. Uh, we talked about the three programs that we initiated in the last Farm Bill, the Vaccine Bank, the National Animal Preparedness Response Program, and the Animal uh, Health Laboratory Network. Uh, but I want to note that, uh, frankly, uh, these programs are only as effective as the people that enact them. 
and an effective response is dependent upon a highly trained uh, veterinarian and support staff who can work with stakeholders to, to contain the certain outbreaks. We have a shortage of veterinarians across the country. Uh, we need to do and take under consideration, I think, in the Farm Bill, a strong pipeline of veterinarian professionals uh, so that we can continue to enforce the efforts of AFID, which is so important uh, that we have and maintain a trained staff to address outbreaks. Um, and so the Farm Bill, of course, uh, does a host of things to uh, ensure, uh, as I said earlier, maintaining uh, food security and, and that food security is a national issue. Uh, we just need to remember, I believe, that the past year the cost of an outbreak will far exceed the cost of supporting disease prevention uh, programs. Remember that. The cost of an outbreak far exceeds the cost of, of these prevention programs. With that said, um, Secretary Moffat, looking at the current response, and you partially answered that question uh, by the chair, the answer to the chairman's question, in terms of what improvements you think need to be made to optimize future outbreaks. Uh, and is there the authority with AVID currently that lacks to, would provide a more effective response? And because of your previous experience that I'm aware of, not just as a, as a farmer producer, but uh, in uh, California's uh, agricultural department, how think you we can more closely coordinate the efforts between state and federal uh, efforts to manage these 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 uh, diseases? Well, thank you for that question, and um, I, you know I think there's a, a few things. So. First, uh, coming, as you've recognized, coming from the California Department of Food and Agriculture, in fact, um, in, I think, early 2020, before the pandemic, uh, thanks to funding from NADPREP and through the partnership that the state and federal government um, really strongly uh, have in co collaboration, we did a tabletop exercise for should there be a foot and mouth disease outbreak in the dairy industry in California. So that funding, I know firsthand how important it can be for states in readiness and preparedness, as well as, of course, with industry partners and university and land-grant partners as well. Um, that partnership's critical. Yes, it is. And we need to build on it. Um, you know, our trading partners uh, often use, uh, you know, uh, non-tariff barriers to, um, I think, uh, uh, deal with their internal politics in terms of our ability to trade. Um, and I'm wondering if you've developed a strategy toward maintaining uh, our trade efforts when we have efforts to, uh, to vaccinate, especially in light of the high path uh, uh, impacts and the potential and concerns about them. And of course, we've dealt with depopulation, as, as you all know. Yeah, so as your question um, relates as we're, as we're looking at all different tools in the tool chest, um, they're very important, and you asked about uh, the different mechanisms that we have, and Dr. Noggle can talk a little bit about some of the lessons that are, we're learning in the current outbreak and how we're applying that. Um, but I'll just quickly answer the vaccine question. It is very important as we consider vaccine. First off, there were many, many, uh, many months, in fact, 18 to 24 months down the road. A ARS is now really doing research trials at this point. Um, but important is that we, as we look at and evaluate uh, a potential for a vaccine, we're looking at things like human health, animal health, trade impacts, and um, also implementation of a vaccine strategy. So there's many things that would, we would be factoring and weighing. Yeah, my well. time is expiring here. Uh, Dr. Quickly, uh, how do our trading partners look at our ability to maintain high standards to contain any health impacts? Could you comment quickly? Yeah, I mean, our trade partners, we are working actively with many different trade partners around the world on um, regionalization approach so that we have um, in, in place, and this is something we developed since the 2015 outbreak, strong regionalization approach for both high path AI as well as we're developing it for African swine and, and our efforts to improve diagnostic and surveillance technology, it comes uh, hand in hand with that, right? Absolutely, absolutely. If how we know where the disease how we doing is, we there? can keep it. Sir? Well, my time's expired. I was asking how are we doing there? <clears throat> to improve diagnostic and surveillance technology? How will we improve it? We will constantly improve it. We're working with our labs network around the country. Um, rapid 
detection and, and diagnostic technology is really important, and some of the nat, uh, the the funding for the um, the lab network has also been for rapid de diagnostic testing as well. Thank you. Great. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Alabama and my good friend um, Congressman Moore for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, over the Easter break, I had some hearings, you know, with our ag, we call them listening sessions in Alabama. And one of the things that I noticed, it, feral hogs, it is starting to be an issue. And I can remember growing up, we had the military base, Fort Rucker, and they were getting kind of into farmer's land now. But it seemed like all over the district, in the second congressional district, we had these questions about feral hogs. And I, I was really glad we had the pilot program in 2018, before I got here, that, that my colleagues put in. But uh, if you don't mind, Under Secretary or, or Dr. Noggle, if, if y'all could kind of elaborate on some of the things that are going on for this, the, the feral swine, the control process, and what the outlook, if we've got any optimistic predictions for the future. Yeah, thank you for recognizing the pilot program that is a partnership with NRCS and APHIS together, um, which I think is a really unique uh, opportunity in, in, in a pilot uh, to really together uh, and take a whole of USDA approach, um, improved access to landowners. We've worked with over 6,000 landowners in the country through this pilot program and partnered on over 8 million acres of land to, to work on removing and eradicating feral hogs. This is in complementary to annual appropriations that APHIS continues to receive and has received since 2014. We've been successful to date in successfully eradicating feral hogs from seven states, and we're working on, and we're close to four more additional states. I hope Alabama's on one of those <laughs> lists. The, uh, are, are, what, are the, what are the promising, what are you guys seeing that you feel good about in the program as far as eradication? Are there, I understand there's some, some medications or some treatments they're finding that seem to be work. Is that, that the case, Dr. Noggle? Is that what you're seeing? Yes, Dr. Noggle. Yes, um, I, our wildlife services unit uses a variety of complementary tools to be able to eradicate those hogs. Now on to the next question. I got a, a, a lot of concern about last week was chronic wasting disease, and this kind of wreaked havoc on deer populations across country. Um, I was happy for the passage of the Chronic Wasting Disease Research and Management Act last Congress, which authorized additional annual funding to be divided equally between CWD research and state and tribal CWD management efforts. Under Secretary Moffitt and Dr. Noggle, can you talk about APHIS ongoing work to manage CWD and the promising developments on that front as well? Yeah, I'll kick it off and pass it on to Dr. Noggle. Um, yes, as you mentioned, chronic waste and disease is absolutely devastating in so many states. Chair Thompson also mentioned that as well. Um, we were pleased that we were able to, um, thanks again to, to funding that we've received through Congress, be able to allocate another $12 million toward that combination of research and state partnerships because that is such an important thing, the mix of, of both understanding as well as applying our work together. And I'll pass it to Dr. Noggle. Yeah, I'll extend a little bit on Undersecretary Moffitt's comment about the funding we've provided to states, tribes, um, and universities. In 2022, we provided $9.5 million to those states, tribes, universities for these cooperative agreements that help them control CWD, not only in farm servid populations, but wild servid populations as well. And we just announced last week the additional $12 million. Very excited about that. Within APHIS, we really have two approaches. On the wildlife side, our um, wildlife services, again, conducts research and supports wildlife management activities with regard to CWD. And on the farm service side, we do have our voluntary herd certification program, of which um, 28 states participate in. Okay, thank you, Dr. Noggle. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you. Next, I now recognize the gentlewoman from Connecticut for five minutes. Thank you. Animal diseases can be devastating to any farm, but especially to the small family farms that represent the majority of operations in the United States. Under Secretary Moffitt, in your testimony, you highlighted the gap between the minority of large wealthy farms and the majority of small struggling farms. The farms in Connecticut's fifth district represent this fact. You've been there, so you know. 94% of them are family farms and 92% have less than 100,000 in sales value. For example, producers in my district may rely on fewer than two dozen dairy cows for their livelihood, and any diseases could, be, could do irreparable damage to their way of life. 
Under Secretary Moffitt, can you describe how the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services disseminates information to the smallest and most vulnerable producers? And additionally, to what extent does your agency work directly with farmers to improve biosecurity and develop best practices? Congresswoman Hayes, thank you so much for that question. And um, working with and making sure that we are prioritizing farmers of all sizes, of all backgrounds, who are working in different fields and different value add uh, is very important and is a priority, as you probably have heard in the Secretary's testimony as well, making sure that we are supporting the many and all of the farmers. So thank you for asking that question. As far as outreach and how are we reaching out through our different APHIS programs, we have a couple different programs, actually several different programs, but a couple that I'll highlight and Dr. Noggle can add some more as well. So we have things like the De Defend the Flock program, um, which is really about partnering and disseminating information about signs, symptoms of highly pathogenic avian influenza, and then also our partnership with states as we work on stamping out the disease and making sure that producers have access to indemnity payments and that all producers know of the available resources that we have. On African swine fever, it's the same thing. We have a, a Protect Our Pigs campaign. These campaigns are very much in partnership with industry, with states, with Cooperative Extension, who I know are such important tools and, and, and partners for particularly small producers, but producers of all size. So these are very important as we get information out and disseminate and so that everyone, even Backyard farmers to small farmers to, to larger farmers have access to this really critical, important information. Dr. Noggle. And I would just echo some of Undersecretary Moffitt's comments. Um, we have a nationally distributed workforce in APHIS Veterinary Services, and you'll often see our employees at local meetings with livestock producers on the farm with um, producers, small families, whether they're helping them to work through a regulatory problem, just doing a check-in and providing education, um, that, that's key. Um, I would also add that, um, again, the work through NADPREP, um, the National Animal Disease Preparedness and Response Program, many of the projects that we've funded have worked and focused on outreach with some of the particular producer groups that you described, right? Because we recognize that um, we need to reach out to those producers maybe in a different way than some of our big national um, uh, communication programs like Defend the Flock or Protect Our Pigs. Thank you. I think we have to be intentional about making sure this information reaches the smallest of farmers so that our work can really be done well. You also mentioned, um, Undersecretary, the need for public sector animal health professionals and veterinarians. Connecticut is home to 20 agricultural science and technology education programs, such as the one at Chapag Valley School in Washington, Connecticut. Give me two minutes and I'm gonna to get to education somehow. <laughs> These programs provide high school students with agro-science caseworking career exposure in agricultural management, mechanics, biotechnology, animal science, and more. Under Secretary Moffitt, very quickly, can education programs targeted at high schoolers help alleviate workforce shortages in the animal health sector? And are you aware of any strategies that APHIS and USDA will use to support agricultural science and technology education programs? Uh, thank you so much for that question. And absolutely, those programs that you described are such an important part of building our workforce. Get, bringing in students in this talented pipeline, I think, is so important. At APHIS, we have the Act Discovery Program that is actively working with high schoolers, middle schoolers, to build that pipeline. And for, for youth who are interested in sciences, interested in agriculture, to discover through this Act Discovery Program different possible careers um, so that Hopefully they come and, and want to work at USDA or um, in agriculture at large. Thank you. I'll just close by saying I'm so incredibly proud of Chapag Valley High School and their agroscience program in my district, and I'm going to put my neck out there and extend an invitation to you to visit at any time. My time expired. I yield back, but I do apologize in advance. I have to go to another hearing. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, I now recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin for five minutes. Thank you very much for coming. I just have a few questions for you, Madam Undersecretary. Um, I'm particularly concerned about uh, diseases being introduced, introduced to our herds and flocks around the country. It has a devastating uh, economic impact on agriculture. Uh, and one of the things that I'd like to ask you about is African swine flu. Are we importing 
hogs from Africa? I can have Dr. Noggle talk a little bit more about some of the, the interlocking and, and the things that we're doing to make sure that we keep African swine fever out of the country. African swine fever is unfortunately in many countries and, and particularly close to us is in this, the in Dominican Rico, Republic right. and Haiti as well. Yeah. Um, I'll talk, uh, pass it to Dr. Noggle to talk about the different things, but important is the import controls that we have that Dr. Right, Noggle so I'm, I'm just gonna cut you off here. Um, I know the answer. I'm asking this, are we importing pork into this country from anywhere? That's just an example because it's the African swine fever. Are we importing pork into the United States? Yes, we import pork and pork products. Okay. Um, are we importing poultry into the United States? Yes. Okay. We import poultry and poultry products into the United States. All right. So I understand this. So can you maybe explain to me why we're importing pork into the United States and poultry into the United States when the American farmer is capable of producing these in nearly unlimited capacity if they have the appropriate types of, of uh, regulatory controls established by the government. Yeah, so international trade that we uh, enjoy goes two way. And so yeah. there are some types of product that are important that we can Im import here for consumer preferences. Um, but what is very important as we are importing and as we have protocols in place for importing product is that we are making sure that the product that is coming in is free from disease and not introducing a foreign animal disease or a food safety risk to any any of our industry and people in the country. I understand. So I just I'm I'm asking you, do you think that potentially some of the policies that have been put in place are restricting our ability to produce the pork and poultry here? including exporting them, because I'm having a really hard time uh, understanding why we're importing, and, and pretty soon we're gonna be a net importer for agriculture. And I think that this, from my perspective, a lot of that is due to some very restrictive policies that I'd like to see. Uh, I'd like to see us open them up a little bit so we could produce pork and poultry and serve it around the world as opposed to potentially importing these animals into the country that introduce these horrible diseases into our uh, flocks and our herds. Yeah, so I think what's really important is that we are we are working and actively working on supporting and protecting our own industry so our own industry continue to grow and yeah. thrive to produce food for our domestic consumers as well as abroad. And I'd like Dr. Noggle to talk about just some of the things that we have in place so that when product is becoming imported that we aren't introducing or and we're reducing the risk of introducing any foreign animal diseases. Please do, Doctor. Yeah, thank you, my pleasure. Um, so within APHIS, uh, we have a group that just focuses on regionalization services. And so whenever a country requests to import any kind of animal or animal product into the United States, we begin um, an extensive and a quite long process of evaluating their um, veterinary infrastructure, the disease status of various different diseases in their country, as well as what mitigations they have in place to prevent future outbreaks or respond should those outbreaks occur. Um, after that process occurs, we uh, do multiple site visits, we do formal risk assessments, all of that prior to publishing a proposed rule that would allow for public comment for people to let us know what they think about whether we would recognize certain countries um, to allow for trade or not. Great, thank you, Doctor. I'm sorry, my time's my, gonna expire understand. real quick. Um, then, Madam Undersecretary, I'd like to you know, put on your marketing hat real quick. Uh, we go to the store, we can buy skim milk, we can buy 1% milk, and we can buy 2% milk. You know what the fat content of whole milk is? I don't. I want to say it's somewhere around 6%. It is not. It's 3.5%. That's 3 the problem. So people think they get skim milk 1%, 2%, and they think they're drinking butter when they have whole milk. So I'm going to ask you, I'd like to get with your staff, we have to be able to change this because we're prohibited from marketing whole milk as 3.5% milk. So people think they're getting 6% or 10% or 15%, and they believe that it's, that it's unhealthy when, in fact, it is the most healthy form of milk. So I'm going to ask you to commit to getting with me and my staff to see if we can, you put your marketing hat on it, we can get this changed so that people, the American consumer understands exactly what they're consuming. 
I will absolutely be happy to have our staff and your staff connect. Well, thank you, Madam Under Secretary and Doctor. I appreciate it with that. I yield back. I now recognize the gentleman from Colorado for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Mann, and to Ranking Member Costa, and thank you for hosting uh, the hearing this morning. Under Secretary Moffitt and Dr. Noggle, thank you for taking the time to be here to provide your testimony. Uh, these issues are all very important to me. One of the counties that I represent is Well County, Colorado, um, which is a leading producer of beef, cattle, and dairy, and I'm glad that animal health is the focus of our first subcommittee hearing. I do want to reiterate the comments that Chairman Mann said about the ear, um, ear tag program and trying to make that um, cost as, um, as small to the Producers. I know that um, that is something that has been brought up on my um, ag listening tours. Um, but speaking about diseases in wildlife and, and feral animals, um, they increasingly pose risks to human and agricultural health and our economy, as evidenced by the recent outbreaks that have been um, spoken about with a highly pathogenic avian influenza in the U.S. and African swine fever in the Caribbean. Generally, uh, what is the USDA currently doing to assess disease spillover from wildlife, enhance wildlife disease surveillance, and develop cost-effective mitigation efforts that can be deployed at scale in the event of an outbreak? Thank you so much for that question. And I'll, um, I'll pass it on to Dr. Noggle to answer more fully, but I just want to highlight, of course, as you well know from Colorado, the National Wildlife Research Center in Fort Collins, Colorado, and the importance of um, that program as a key part of our wildlife research program. That program is doing important surveillance on 31 different diseases in wildlife, and the work on monitoring wild birds particularly was a key early indicator for us in our highly pathogenic avian influenza response. So I'll talk, pass it to Dr. Noggle for further answer. Great, thanks for this question. This is an area that I think all of us in uh, animal agriculture really understand the risk at that wildlife livestock interface. And I think if you look at historically some of the diseases that we've had control programs for in the United States, like tuberculosis, brucellosis, we know that both of those have um, a wildlife component in them, right? So with meant to specifically answer your question, with many of our disease programs, we do conduct wild surveillance in different wildlife species surrounding herds that might be infected with diseases that we know can affect wildlife, like TB. We know we have the greater Yellowstone area with brucellosis, and we work very hard to implement mitigations there so we don't get brucellosis in cattle in that greater Yellowstone area. Um, additionally, the feral swine program that we talked about earlier, um, surveillance is conducted on those swine to help us look at things like swine brucellosis, um, pseudo rabies, as well as monitor for the potential for ASF or CSF. So we really look at um, our disease control comprehensively and um, consider both wildlife and livestock. Are there resources needed to replace the existing funds that came from the American Rescue Plan um, that were dedicated to uh, addressing some of these concerns and efforts? Thank you for highlighting the funding that was received through the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we are working actively on implementing that funding. At this point, um, the funding has been able to, to identify different research projects and implementation for that inter interface of COVID-19 and, and animals, um, and between animals, and then also between animals and human health. Uh, so that funding has been important, and we have we have additional funds through that that we're working on uh, developing and, and, and ensuring that funding is, is put to good use as well. Perfect, thank you both so much, and I yield back my time. Uh, the chairman recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I, I think you've both been uh, working around this question that I'm going to ask you just now, but uh, just for further clarifications, I'll ask it maybe a little different way. What steps is the USDA taking to work with outside stakeholders such as state departments of ag, animal health officials, wildlife experts, uh, to inform the public, especially those with backyard flocks, about biosecurity and resources on what symptoms to look for to help mitigate the spread of avian influenza? Uh, yeah, there's a, a lot of resources that um, APHIS has been putting into play, and Dr. Nago can talk about some of them specifically. Um, I mentioned the Defend the, the Flock program. That's an important one. The partnerships that you identified with states, with 
with the industry, with Cooperative Extension, with other nonprofits and tribal organizations. Uh, all of those different layers of, of partnerships are very important so that we're reaching different constituents who are getting information from different information sources. Uh, but I'll talk, pass it to Dr. Noggle. Yeah, thank you. It's really a whole of industry response with regard to outreach and education, right? Um, in addition to some of the things um, previously mentioned, we do provide cooperative agreement funding directly to states that are impacted by HPAI to assist with their response as well as education and outreach with those local producers. Okay. I'll, I'll just add on, my daughter, uh, until we moved to DC, uh, was a 4-H member, and we would get information through the 4-H network. So there's lots of different avenues and wonderful avenues to get that information. Okay, thank you. Undersecretary, is there an end in sight to the current uh, high path outbreak? And if, it, if the disease is here to stay, how does uh, that alter APHIS's approach to dealing with the disease moving forward? Uh, thank you so much for that question, Representative. That is an important question. One that I don't have an answer to. I wish I had a crystal ball to, to really know. But I think what is very important, and, and um, I can, I'll pass it to Dr. Noggle to talk about this because she so clearly identified it last week in a meeting uh, that we had with industry, is, is as we are working, um, just like we took lessons learned from the 2015 outbreak, we're already incorporating lessons learned in this 2022-2023 outbreak. And that includes things like looking at and evaluating biosecurity and what more can we do on biosecurity because we know that is the one most effective thing in reducing lateral spread, uh, but also how we're looking at and reducing the attractiveness of wild birds because we know the virus load is very strong in, in the wild bird population and we want to reduce the in, introduction from wild birds. Thank you. Um, additionally, I'll add that um, we also really are working at the um, at the farm level to help do biosecurity assessments so producers can go through their facilities and identify if there's opportunity for wild birds to get in there and potentially infect their flocks. I think that's a really important next step for us. Um, I think you're leading toward the vaccination question. And um, so to that regard, um, we are currently behind the scenes having conversations with international trading partners. Dr. Sifford goes to um, the World Organization for Animal Health in May, and HPAI will be a major topic um, at that meeting, and she'll discuss with her counterparts across the world um, how we need, if we need to look at vaccination differently. Um, right now, our partners at Agricultural Research Service are investigating different strains of potential vaccine for possible licensure, and internally, we are um, determining plans for how we might uh, implement a vaccine strategy. However, right now, today, we believe strongly that our response has been effective. Whenever we've identified HPAI in a case in domestic poultry, we've effectively stamped it out. And due to the great trade consequences of vaccine at this point, we're planning for the future, but continuing on the current path. Thank you. Okay, and by reading my mind uh, and answering my last question, I can yield back 47 seconds. Thank you. I now recognize the gentleman from Maine for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you for holding this um, hearing. Nice to see you, Undersecretary. Uh, thank you for being with us, and thank you, Dr. Nago, for uh, participating as well. I'm going to take a slightly different turn um, and talk about aquaculture. Maine aquaculture is about an 85 to $100 million a year um, business represents about 25 different species of finfish, shellfish, sea vegetables, and is about 700 jobs in our state. So aquatic animal health is very important to us. Um, APHIS has a National Aquaculture Health Plan and Standards, um, which was released in 2021, which supports aquatic livestock health. But could you give me a little bit of an update about the work you're doing to protect aquatic animal health, and what should we be doing in the Farm Bill to future your efforts? Thank you, Representative Pingree, for that question. I'm going to pass it to Dr. Noggle to talk about it, um, but just wanted to thank, uh, highlight that the, 
The standards are out there. We are working with industry and states on implementing it, and Dr. Nagel can talk more about that. Yeah, thank you. The aquaculture industry is really an exciting uh, industry, right? It's really growing, and um, we're really happy to be supporting producers at the forefront. Um, first, we did receive additional funding in the omnibus for FY 2023, and we're using that to further develop what we're calling the CAPS, which is the Comprehensive Aquaculture Health program standards. And what that allows us to do is it develops an approach where aquaculture producers address things like biosecurity, surveillance, um, other types of management practices that support aquatic health and allow them to be competitive both um, interstate trade as well as potentially international trade. And we're very excited about that. Um, we've uh, with that money, we also plan to um, provide about $1 million in cooperative agreements with laboratories to help us further like the laboratory capacity with regard to aquatic um, diseases, which is something we haven't really focused on much in the past. And then finally, we continue to do um, risk assessments and pathway assessments to look at certain high consequence diseases of aquatic um, species to determine if any additional actions need to be taken um, with regard to movement of animals. Great, well thank you for that work and I'm glad to see you're putting the um, new funding to work and we'll look forward to working with you on that. Um, Back to the avian influenza, which I know is on everyone's mind. Um, in Maine, even though we were once a huge poultry producing state, we're now much more like of a small, medium sized backyard flocks. And unfortunately, uh, in a backyard flock, you have more opportunities for making that connection with wildlife. And I know you've been talking quite a bit about that. Um, wild birds, of course, um, but also in Maine, we had a um, avian influenza detected in our harbor seals. Um, and so because we have a lot of saltwater farming, a lot of coastal farming, that's something we're concerned about too. So can you just talk a little bit about the interfacing you're doing with backyard flocks? And uh, I know you've talked a little bit about how you try to control it in wildlife, but just some of those issues, how you're educating farmers about how to watch for it and make sure we're not spreading it. I know we've had some outbreaks in Maine with backyard flocks. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, certainly how, how to watch for it and the education and the work that we're doing with farmers, backyard farmers, with household farmers, with, um, with industry um, at large, um, I think is such an important part. Actually, and I just learned last week, the first case that we found um, that was detected in Indiana um, was because of education campaign that APHIS had done on how to de understand and detect symptoms that birds might be exhibiting um, when having high path mm. avian influenza. So it just shows the success of the program and I think that is important. And making sure, as I mentioned before, that we're working with multiple different partners who are reaching different, um, different audiences, I think is a very important part. I know the information that I used to get on my farm is different even from the information that a neighboring farmer would give. Um, and so that I think is an important part. Identifying and then also knowing what to do when you do identify that there are symptoms, calling a local vet, calling cooperative extension, calling the state animal health official, um, and, and how to be able to be able to respond to that. And then of course also bringing in the state officials mm -hmm. and then who might also invite APHIS to join as well. I think all of those interlocking efforts are very important. Dr. Noggle, anything additional? Great, well I yield back, but thank you very much for being with us today and the work you're doing. Thank you, Representative. I, re I now recognize the gentleman from Nebraska for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Dr. Noggle, or Secretary, Under Secretary Moffitt and Dr. Noggle for being here. Uh, one of the things I'm very proud of in the last Farm Bill, we were able to put in the foot and mouth disease vaccine bank. If you already talked about this, I apologize. I have multiple hearings going on simultaneously right now. But could you give us the status of the foot and mouth disease vaccine bank? Is it fully operational in your mind? Or, or what else do we need to be doing? I'll kick it off and Dr. Noggle can talk more fully about this. Um, the foot and mouth vaccine bank, thanks to the 2018 Farm Bill, we've been able to invest $52 million in the, in the vaccine bank as a whole. Um, and that has been very important. And, and Dr. Noggle can talk about some of the practices that we've employed um, so that we make sure that we've got, as we talk about the vaccine bank, it's an important insurance policy. 
first and foremost is biosecurity uh, and, and our work together with industry and in stamping out the disease, uh, but to have that vaccine bank as an insurance policy is such an important part. Dr. Nagel. Yes, thanks. I'll share some um, additional detail there. So right now within the National Animal Vaccine and Veterinary Countermeasures Bank, um, we have access to vaccine antigen concentrate for foot and mouth disease. We have access to finished vaccine for classical swine fever. And we also recently purchased um, diagnostic test kits for both FMD and ASF, right? So the countermeasures in the vaccine bank is, is more than just FMD, right? Okay. It's, it's much more comprehensive. Um, as far as the number of doses that we have in the bank, our goal is to be able to have um, somewhere between 10 to 25 million doses per each strain of FMD that we bank, and um, we have, I believe, 10 um, strains that we're currently banking antigen against. Um, that goal of 25 million doses per year is, is a minimum goal, right? It wouldn't necessarily cover everything in the event of an FMD outbreak, but would, it would allow us to use a vaccine initially um, should it be needed. Um, the last thing I'll say is the determination of what vaccines we use, the strains that we bank against, are made by a uh, subject matter expert panel that kind of help us decide based on the epidemiology and the geography of those diseases, which are the highest risk. So would you consider yourselves fully operational with, this, with the vaccine bank, or is, it, there's, is there more work to do to get there's to There's always full? more work to do, sir. Always okay. more work to do. But, so there's always more work to do, but uh, would you consider yourself fully operational at this point? Yes. Okay, if, we not, needed to, if we needed to deploy mm -hmm. vaccine tomorrow, we would right. have access to FMD and CSF vaccine tomorrow. The reason I asked that question, a couple of years ago they said, well, we're minimally operational. We've got more work to do. So I think we're probably at a – now you're just at a oh, sustainment. Oh, for sure. Yeah, Absolutely. you're at a sustainment level. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry I missed That's all right. That. Well, I, I didn't probably say the question quite right either. And, well, first of all, I think I, I want to thank the Nebraska – cattlemen, and also the Nebraska pork industry, because they came to me back in 2017, so it was a top priority. Mm -hmm. And we were able to work hard. Initially, I was told it was too early. Maybe there's need more research to get there, but I'm so proud that we've been able to achieve this uh, huge milestone. Uh, Secretary Vilsack said they're make, you're, you're making pretty good progress on the African swine fever vaccine. Can you just give the, uh, our citizens a, uh, just an update where we're at? Yeah, I had the opportunity to um, travel to Vietnam where mm -hmm. ARS, in partnership with the Vietnamese government, is working on um, field trials as we speak on African swine fever uh, vaccine trials for a, a handful of different vaccine strains. Um, and I think that is mm -hmm. making very good progress, just like with the high path avian influenza vaccine that Dr. Nagel talked about. Um, as we look toward and, and work on uh, what that looks like and how once it gets developed and, and we have um, a plan in place on how it would be able to be implemented, there are many other factors that we would be considering. Uh, and Dr. Nagel can, can expand on this more, uh, but certainly the human factors, animal health factors, uh, what, uh, you know, what is the efficacy of the vaccine? Um, and how would we maintain and, and look at and, and evaluate trade in, in all of those as well as we distribute? When, when you see what it did to the Chinese pork industri industry, just yeah. devastated it. So I'm glad we're, we're ahead of the game here and have some preventative measures and some reactionary measures if it happens. One last question. Is your level of research dollars or appropriations adequate to do what you need to do? Uh, you know, that is a very good question, uh, Representative. And I think, you know, uh, across the board, we, we do what we can with the research funds that we have. And I, and I know Dr. Jacob Young has, has been before the, the, um, the Senate to talk about the level of research dollars we have and, and the advancement that we're doing in research. I think what's really important is the partnership that we have with industry, the partnership that we have with universities and land-grant universities um, to be able to maximize the dollars that we have. Um, but as, as always, and everything that we do, we can always do more with more funding. With that, I yield. Thank you. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Congressman Davis, for five minutes. Thanks so much, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Well, good morning, and thank you so much for being here to ensure our producers have consistent, predictable USDA guidelines on animal disease and prevention. 
Um, the hog and poultry industries are powerful economic drivers um, in agriculture, particularly in eastern North Carolina. Um, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service um, just announced more than 15 million um, for 60 projects, including one at North Carolina State University. Um, designed to extend a between farm African swine fever transmission model to estimate the necessary number of sample collectors in a highly swine dense region. Um, my question under Secretary, can you give me a timeline based on previously awarded funding for the rollout of the National Animal Disease Preparedness and Response Program grants? Thank you for that question, and uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Davis, for, for highlighting one of the projects that just recently received funding. It is exciting as I look at the funding that we do have and that we're able to, to invest in projects, just the, the breadth and diversity of the projects that are funded, um, how those projects, the determination of projects is funded through. Uh, similar to the Vaccine Bank, we bring in a, a group of experts to really identify the top priority in funding for each year. That money is distributed each year, so we, uh, when you ask about the timing, and I can pass to Dr. Noggle about specifics for this recent round of funding, um, but we do announce the funding every year so that there's an annual cycle of new funding available. And as far as these existing projects and uh, what they're looking like, Dr. Noggle? Yes, so um, correct. Uh, every year we've, we provide funding for these projects on both the NAD prep side, which you talked about, as well as the NON side, right, which goes to the different laboratories. Um, the prior announcement that we just did was um, probably the largest that we've had. It was for the 15.8 million for the 60 projects. Um, that's because we know that the last year we went to um, a steady state of $18 million for the NAD prep program. Um, so uh, beyond that, I would say that these agreements tend to be for a year renewable up to a second year. So the projects that were initiated very early on in the course of the farm bank, the farm bill funding have, have um, are in final stages of being completed at this time. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Eastern North Carolina has a very robust agriculture workforce and a large presence of poultry producers. And I've heard from um, s several in the industry and labor leaders, um, given a recent outbreak of the highly uh, pathogenic avian um, influenza, how do you assess product safety and workplace uh, safety, which go hand in hand at large poultry processing facilities? <clears throat> Thank you, Representative Davis, for that question. And Dr. Noggle can talk specifically about uh, some of the safety procedures. Um, I will just say that uh, we are, take safety very important. Uh, we want to make sure that as the team is coming in and working in these, um, these poultry houses or, or different facilities that have contagious diseases, that we're making sure that we are protecting everyone, our workforce, as well as all of the workforce that's there. Um, we're also making sure that we have a rapid response core that it has the flex capacity so that we're not overextending our workforce as well and we have a, a rapid response team to be able to handle that. Dr. Noggle. Yeah, I would just add from the worker safety perspective um, in the event of a response, um, our, in, anyone who's working on that response wears the appropriate personal protective equipment. We also have a safety officer on site at all responses to ensure worker safety. We also collaborate with local state departments and the CDC to ensure um, post-response uh, monitoring for signs of flu. Okay, thank you for the response. Over the past several years, Congress has shown tremendous support um, for the agriculture quarantine, quarantine inspection program, um, most recently with the reintroduction of the Beagle Brigade Act. How important is this program for keeping foreign animal and plant diseases and pests out of the United States? And how does your agency work with Customs and Border Protections to ensure its success? Thank you, Representative Davis, for that question. And that is such an important part. It is a really important factor in, um, in keeping foreign animal diseases out of the country is APHIS's partnership with CBP that you identified. Um, the AQI funding is the funding source for that partnership. Uh, it allows us to be able to fund our partners at CBP. Any of us who've come into the country from foreign travel have been interviewed and asked whether we're bringing in animal products, and that is a really important piece 
of the, our defense mechanism to prevent uh, foreign animal diseases from coming in. We also, through that funding, are funding things like the um, detector dog teams that are used at many airports and also parcel facilities. So that product that is coming in via person or also parcel is inspected. These are all funded through the AQI fees. And um, you want to just recognize Congress for, for being able to supplement the AQI fees. AQI fees, for those who might not be familiar, receive various funding sources, but part of it is through international air travel. And when international air travel um, closely screeched to a halt at the beginning of the pandemic, the funding source also dropped significantly. But thanks to supplemental funding from Congress, we've received close to a billion dollars in additional funds to continue to make sure that we have our safeguards in place um, at all of our points of entry so that we don't um, introduce foreign animal diseases into the country. Thank you, Mr. Yilba. And I recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Congressman Feenster, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Mann, for holding this hearing. You look good in that uh, chairmanship. Uh, thank you for doing this. Um, I also want to thank the Undersecretary Moffitt and Dr. Uh, uh, Neagle for, for being here. Um, in Iowa, obviously, the avian uh, influenza outbreak has been very extreme. I think uh, the four, a fourth of the birds uh, in, in, that were depopulated came from Iowa. 58 million uh, birds were affected in 47 states, and we had 16 million of turkeys, chickens, and birds destroyed in Iowa. Um, so this is significant. Um, I've lived through it. I, I've lived through the 2015 and, and since. Uh, I've seen a lot of changes, which is great, uh, you know, um, working with uh, APHIS and then also our Secretary of Ag, Mike, Mike Nag in Iowa, uh, the depopulation times decreased from 15.5 days in 2015 to about four days in 2022. So this is very, very significant. Um, either one of you, our Undersecretary, is there anything the agency can do to start looking at minimizing the risk or can we, can we look at predictive modeling, anything that can help our producers to try to minimize this from happening each year, uh, and, and again, trying to curb uh, the effects? Thank you for that question. And, and you know, I want to just uh, acknowledge just the deep impact that highly pathogenic avian influenza has had on producers, has had on consumers as well. Um, I, I, we, in this hearing, really talk about and, and highlight the success that we've seen from the Farm Bill programs. They're working in our current outbreak, as you talked about, a big difference from 2015. Um, but that doesn't, um, and, and that's been great in many ways, but it certainly has deeply impacted the producers. You ask about what additional measures that we're taking and predictive tools, and there are a lot of different things that we're doing. First off, I want to highlight biosecurity. We've worked with producers and producer industry has also worked with, with producers on developing more robust biosecurity plans and training for those biosecurity plans so that they're implemented by producers. We've seen a reduction in lateral spread, which is spread between house to house, um, from 70% in the 2015 outbreak to around 15, 16% in this current outbreak. So a big significant reduction there. We have more to do. We know, as you mentioned, um, the virus is, is prevalent in the wild bird population. So how do we reduce the attractiveness of the farms um, from wild bird populations is another avenue that we're working at. Predictive modeling and our partners at Wildlife Services and our partners with fish and wildlife agencies across the country at states um, is a very important part of what we're doing as well. We talked about the lab network through NALN. Yeah. We're testing over 22 million, we've tested over 2 million birds so that we understand and know where the birds are traveling so our industry can be prepared. Yeah, awesome. When you talk about Nolan, obviously that's born out of Iowa too. Iowa State University is home to the world renowned vet diagnostic lab. And uh, you know they're doing a lot. I, I'm concerned, is there anything that we can do to uh, uh, help undertake the current workload and be more prepared uh, from the, the lab and Nolan? You know, anything that we can do in the farm bill that you look at and say, hey, this might be a good idea? You know, for the lab networks, the, the variety of funding sources that, uh, that the NALM network receives is very important, uh, certainly through state funding, through land grant funding, yep. through appropriations, as well as Farm Bill. And that, I think, the variety of funding sources 
I believe has been very important for those lab networks. Dr. Noggle, is there anything additional? Um, I would just add that um, earlier today we talked about some of the gaps in the veterinary workforce. Yep. And I think when you talk about the workforce of the laboratory, it's an even more specialized group of people, right? Because they have these additional yep. skills and capabilities. So I think workforce development for laboratories awesome. is critical. So I got, I got one, I'm just going to pivot here, and it has the same thing. When you talk about African swine fever, the same my biggest concern is, hey, what we, we surely don't want it, but if it happens, I seen this in 2015, uh, depopulation of birds is one thing. Uh, when you have to uh, euthanize uh, hogs is another thing, and we saw this with COVID when we had to do it with COVID. Uh, are you really taking serious measures of how, what this is gonna look like when you've gotta depopulate large animals and where are they gonna go? I know China's having this issue, right? I mean, you can't really just bury them because the, the disease stays. I mean, have these things been thought through? Representative Feenstra, thank you for that really important question. As we have been, we've been absolutely preparing for the, un, uh, I hope, unlikely event of African swine fever in the country. Um, but that said, we know that we need to be ready and we have been investing through funding through NADPREP as well as through the CCC funding that the Secretary has authorized for African swine fever, um, different mechanisms and rapid response so that we understand how to do disposal. Uh, Dr. Noggle, perhaps you can talk a little bit more. Oh. We're out of time. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I would like a response to that in writing at some point, yes, okay? Absolutely. Thank you. I yield back. Yep. Um, thank you. I now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Congresswoman Spanberger, for five minutes. Thank you so very much, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Undersecretary Moffitt, for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Noggle, thank you for being here as well. It's great to see you both here, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the importance of animal health in American agriculture. Uh, while livestock producers have certainly long known the threat that animal disease pose to our food supply, more Americans uh, in recent times have really come to understand this reality uh, as we have seen the price of eggs continue to go up uh, in part due to the avian flu. As a mother of three children, I certainly know how important this nutritious food staple can be to families. Uh, egg burritos are a fan favorite in my home. <clears throat> and importantly, I have heard from Virginia poultry producers that APHIS has been helpful uh, as a partner in responding to outbreaks in the Commonwealth, so I do want to thank you for that work. Um, but can you please share what USDA is doing to help poultry producers impacted by the avian flu beyond indemnity payments, really to ensure that producers don't go out of business after an outbreak, and I know that you have touched on this uh, periodically throughout your testimony today, um, but I'm really concerned about the long-term impacts on our nation's egg supply and the increase in impact on families and, of course, the producers I represent. Thank you, Representative Spanberger, for that question. And, and um, certainly, as uh, recognized with, with Representative Feenstra as well, the impact of, of what this has done for producers, particularly small producers. You mentioned indemnity. That is a very important part of, um, of the resources and the tools that have come from the Commodity Credit Corporation so that producers are able to capture some of the, the loss looking further at markets and, and expanding and broadening more and new and better markets that we often are working on at the department as well. We're looking at how do we how do we advance more local and regional markets? How do we advance more meat processing capacity, more processing capacity at writ large? Okay. Um, I know we're also and and um, looking at and uh, you know farm services agency is, is evaluating what programs that they have to support producers who have been hit in this distress time as well. Thank you. I'm glad you're thinking about it across the board, as of course I knew you would be. Um, but I look forward to any updates into the future. Um, switching from poultry to cattle, um, I have recently heard from Virginia cattle producers that they're seeing a rise in thylerosis uh, cases within their herds, um, which I, I know you know has a very high mortality rate. Unfortunately, the only way to prevent this disease is through tick control, which can be very costly. Um, I've also recently learned that ELAP, the Emergency Assistance for Livestock, which provides financial assistance to eligible livestock producers for losses due to this disease, um, does not cover losses due to thylerosis. Can you discuss why that is um, and what options exist for livestock producers to help with the cost of tick mitigation and losses associated with this disease? 
Thank you for that question, Representative Spanberger. We can look into, and I can I can connect with FSA on on ELAP and and what is and allow, isn't allowed to be funding. But um, I'd pass it to Dr. Noggle on more things that we're doing. Thank you. Yes. So APHIS um, has been kind of on the forefront since the. Uh, Asian longhorn tick, which is the carrier for thaliriosis in the, in the Virginia area since it was first detected several years ago. Uh, we work with a number of partners, including National Cattlemen's Beef Association, on educational outreach. And uh, while we don't have a vaccine, we do have treatment available for that particular disease. Um, thank you very much. We recently hosted a farm summit in my district, and this was a, an area of significant uh, concern. Uh, and, and frankly, a uh, heated discussion because so many of Virginia's uh, cattle producers are deeply concerned about the impact. So I would love to get additional information. We'll follow up in writing to request that because uh, I do want to make sure that that's available to the, uh, the producers across my district. Um, so thank you very much. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Right, the chair recognizes <clears throat> the gentleman from Missouri, Congressman Alford, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. And Under Secretary Moffitt, I want to talk about workforce a little bit more. I think it's so important. Uh, we all know the importance uh, of having a great APHIS staff in place uh, to help with our preparedness and response. Um, it's my understanding that 13 percent of the total USDA workforce right now is eligible for retirement. Is that correct to your understanding? I don't know the exact right. number, but certainly- We've done a little research on this. Our, our top notch staff has, in the next four years, another 13% mm. is going to be eligible for retirement. That's a big number. What are we doing to make sure that we have the workers in place to create safety? Thank you for that question. And, um, and I think that we are very focused on how do we build our workforce across the board at USDA and, um, and specifically at APHIS. Uh, as you've mentioned, um, uh, our APHIS workforce, I would say, um, I call them our unsung heroes. They're working behind the scenes on making sure our food supply chain is safe, um, that making sure that we've got uh, a safe and secure food supply chain, and they're so important and a critical part, as, as um, I think uh, Ranking Member Costa said, in, in our national food security. Um, so making sure we have a workforce that is ready when, uh, when we do have retirements and that we're constantly flowing in new employees is important. As far as uh, our workforce for emergency response, we're developing a rapid response core so that we can flex our workforce and, and handle response capacity. How big will that be? This, what? How big will this core be for rapid response? It's starting response? out right now with 12 positions. So it's, it's, it's building up. It's just beginning. Um, but at the same time, we also are working on emergency hiring authorities. And so we've hired an emergency through emergency hiring authorities, um, 65 additional staff this year, as well as 25 term limited positions. That said, getting to the core of your question, how do we look long term? We have many programs that are available for high school students who are interested in getting involved in agriculture, becoming veterinarians or other fields in, in agriculture, as well as for college students. And we have different things like an internship program. Dr. Noggle can talk a little bit more about some of the different programs that we have so that we build and keep the pipeline coming in to APHIS and to USDA across I'd the like world. to hear about that because I know this is a big concern all over America, workforce. Yeah. How are you getting young people interested in, in this, really, which is a national security issue? Um, well, sir, I, I think that is it. That's the challenge that we all have, right, is how we need to start young. We need to start with students that are in 4-H, FFA, um, perhaps targeting in areas where we know there are major uh, you know, livestock industries to get some of those students um, interested in animal health jobs. Um, we do have numerous internships within APHIS for really all ages of students, whether high school all the way up through college. And we do have the premier Salty Wilson scholarship program and internship that um, provide some funding for students to attend veterinary school, and upon completion, they return and work for us for a certain period of years. But it's, I think it's really going to take effort from all of us. I don't think it's something that APHIS can do alone, and I think we really need to leverage groups like 4-H and FFA. Mm. Madam Undersecretary, what can we do in Congress to help you in this effort? 
Um, you, well, that is a very good question. I can I can take that back with our team to look more at what it, what types of things that we can ask for from Congress for this. We'll That'd be great. To We'd love to hear that. We'd love to help out. Um, as you know, BSE or mad cow disease exists in two forms, uh, classical and atypical. Can you talk us through the big picture differences in the forms of the disease and explain why we do not restrict imports based on atypical cases of BSC? Thank you for that question, Representative. I'm going to pass it to Dr. Noggle who right. can get into the science on that. Great. So I would really describe it. This is the difference. Um, what we call classical BSE, um, it's a malforming of the of the proteins in the brain, right? And it is infectious. Um, atypical BSE is kind of like that malformation that occurs due to old age. Mm. But when we typically see atypical BSE, even atypical scrapie in sheep, which are in the same family, it tends to be in older animals. And even the World Organization for Animal Health has said atypical scrapie and atypical BSE are not transmissible. When we've gone back and done the investigation with those cattle or with those sheep that have atypical, we, we can't find any exposure. There was no known exposure to other infected animals. Thank so you. So that's the difference. Appreciate you. Thanks again for being here. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Congressman Baird, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I really uh, appreciate this hearing, and I appreciate the witnesses be here. My background being here, but... My background's in research and animal science and so on, and so uh, I really appreciate having this discussion. Uh, my first question really deals with, uh, with uh, Under Secretary Moffitt. Uh, you know, gene editing has been a promising tool for meeting the sustainability, the animal health, and food security demands facing our food supply. And so I was pleased to see the USDA budget request acknowledge animal biotechnology as one of the Secretary's top priorities. So my question is, can you or Dr. Nogo talk more about the potential for gene editing uh, to advance animal health, as well as the potential role of USDA in regulating and approving products for animal biotechnology? No. Thank you for that question, uh, Representative Baird. And um, certainly this is, this, as you described your background, this hearing is, is right up your alley for sure. Animal biotech, as you, as you asked about, um, is an important tool. Just as we talk about our disease response mechanisms and the different tools that we must have in the tool chest, um, as we look forward, right, um, with, with climate change, with other things that animals might need to have to be able to adapt to a changing uh, or hotter climate, um, animal biotech can be a tool that producers uh, may want to be able to tap into. And so the ability for uh, uh, to get this right and to, to advance a regulatory uh, rulemaking process for animal biotech is absolutely an important part of that. At USDA, we have, as you talked about, we have the resources. Um, we're part of the conversation. We have an incredible, talented staff pool um, that is working on biotech in the, on the plant side. Of course, we have a significant number of veterinarians at the department. Um, we have, of course, our trade partners at Foreign Services Agency. So we're looking at all of the different factors and really opening the aperture of what this looks like as we, um, as we regulate gene edited animals. What's really important is that there is a regulatory framework that it supports innovation and safety um, and that it provides certainty for developers because we want to make sure that developers, small, medium, and large, are able to participate in a regulatory framework and that certainty is what we hear is a very important part of that. So at USDA, we have a strong track record for um, developing or for, for regulating genetic engineering and um, you know certainly we want to make sure that we have the best possible regulatory system at play. Thank you. And Dr. Nogo, you have any thoughts? Nothing to add? Uh, I really appreciate the focus on biotechnology. I want to say that again because I really feel that it's going to be important as we move to try to find plants and animals that can adapt to environmental change. And it's also a way of producing or improving our volume on plants and animals. So I really appreciate the focus there. Uh, 
My next question then deals with um, the animal vaccine technologies. So, you know, with the, with the magnitude of challenges posed for these disease outbreaks and the critical need to safeguard our food supply, does USDA agree it should consider any and all options for veterinary countermeasure? Dr. Thank you for that question. And, uh, and for this one, I will certainly pass it on to Dr. Noggle. Yes, so um, with regard to vaccines specifically as a countermeasure, um, we rely on APHIS's Center for Veterinary Biologics to evaluate any possible technology and determine that it's safe, pure, efficacious, and potent. And um, so we would consider new technologies as they're developed. Thank you very much, and uh, we're getting close on time. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield back. Thank you, Congressman Baird. Um, as we wrap here, just some closing remarks from high path avian influenza to African swine fever and from foot and mouth disease to biosecurity measures, this sub subcommittee will continue to work to give animal health and livestock, dairy, and poultry issues the attention that they deserve. These issues, however, also deserve the attention of the House Appropriations Committee, and they deserve the attention not only of the USDA, but also the Food and Drug Administration, where proposed changes to longstanding labeling requirements for reimplanting of shorter acting growth implants for cattle could abruptly stop a common practice that would adversely impact the industry. The issues deserve our attention during the reallocation of the Farm Bill and on the House floor. The livelihood of farmers, ranchers, and agriculture producers, and the consumers whom they often work for is at stake. Under Secretary Moffitt, thank you for participating in today's hearing. Was, oh, you popped in. Okay. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll reinsert. So, um, Congressman Moliner, uh, the member from New York, recognized for five minutes. I apologize, Chairman, uh, but I, I do thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, circle back to uh, a couple of very, I think, somewhat specific New York questions. And so uh, I'll get to that. Uh, obviously, very timely. Uh, we know uh, how a dangerous an outbreak of disease can be. Uh, and of course, uh, over the past year, uh, avian, uh, avian influenza has uh, decimated uh, poultry farms across the country. Um, now, specifically though, uh, considering just how destructive a disease outbreaks can be for farmers and in fact the entire food system, uh, it's essential obviously that USDA and Congress work together to ensure uh, robust prevention. New York farmers, very specifically, uh, are fortunate to benefit from Cornell University's uh, Animal Health Diagnostic Center, which happens to be in my district in upstate New York. Uh, this is one of the most advanced diagnostic laboratories in the country and, of course, helps livestock farms of all sizes uh, throughout my district manage uh, the health of their herd and prevent the spread of disease. Uh, the Animal Health Diagnostic Center is part of the National Animal Health Laboratory Network. And so, very specifically, Under Secretary, uh, could you just speak uh, to how the USDA is working to improve access to facilities like the Animal Health Diagnostic Center to prevent the spread of avian, uh, avian flu and other, other like diseases. Representative, thank you so much for that question. And uh, the National Animal Health Laboratory Network is such an important part of our response mechanism um, so that we have quick diagnostic across the country, as you identified. Um, we, have, we have labs in um, over 40 different states, 43 different states, and that, that network of labs is a critical part of it. You asked about the funding that we have. Thanks to the 2018 Farm Bill, we were able to receive additional funding for the National Animal Health Lab Network, uh, so additional $20 million that have been able to supplement annual appropriations as well as state funding and also land-grant funding that the labs receive. This funding is an important part I saw it, I have not been and visited the lab in Cornell, um, but did get to visit the lab in Minnesota and I saw firsthand what they were able to do with the NALN, that's the acronym, with the NALN funding that they received um, to be able to invest in equipment that could do rapid diagnostics so that when we do have an outbreak, and I was able to see this before we had a high path avian influenza to see how they were ready um, and, and, and with the, the proper equipment and materials to be able to be ready should an outbreak occur so they can do mass diagnostic testing. The quicker we know that we have a disease, the quicker that we know we have a foreign animal diseases, the better we can respond quickly. 
so I appreciate that. I also want to extend uh, certainly an invitation. Uh, uh, Chairman Thompson was just uh, with us uh, in the 19th District, uh, met with the folks at Cornell. Certainly uh, would love to have uh, USDA staff and, and, and yourself visit uh, the great work uh, at, uh, at Cornell. Could you, though, and I apologize if you did cover it, so now in the development of, uh, of, of, of the Farm Bill, what I assume, other than or include inclusive of dollars, what uh, what could Congress be focused on uh, to expand, uh, obviously, access and 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 that support? Well, and and Dr. Nago can go into this more if you're specifically talking about the lab yes. work. Um, I think, you know, the funding, of course, is very important. We hear that from the labs themselves, uh, the flexibility that the funding allows for them to be able to identify what needs they have and for us to be able to fund those, I think, is important as well. Dr. Nagel, what else? That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, and I will say I had the pleasure of being at the Cornell Lab last summer, so I had a very recent tour. It was beautiful. Um, the one thing that I would add, and we've talked about it in a prior question, is um, workforce development for our laboratories as well. And, and what, what, and I apologize, what, what do you recommend as a pipeline to, I mean, beyond funding, to expand uh, at least access uh, and development of the workforce? Uh, well, I have been in, um, in and around your district, and there are incredible technical colleges that New York has. Um, that is an incredible opportunity, if it already isn't, um, as a pipeline to develop high school students and, and college students who are interested in different career options, making sure that they know that working in a lab or working um, in, an animal, um, in an animal health capacity in some way, shape, or form I think is a really important part of building the pipeline and the technical colleges that New York has, as well as technical colleges that we heard in, in Connecticut are really, I think, a valuable tool there. Yeah, I think um, uh, just to further that point, um, uh, ex expanding uh, K-12 ag education, making the connectivity through vocational uh, applied and life science uh, education, and then of course making the connectivity to community colleges and, and higher institutions as a, as, a, as a means of not only creating the path line, Way, but also expanding, uh, expanding the uh, um, uh, and supporting agriculture uh, in in upstate New York. So I, I just appreciate that and look forward uh, perhaps to to hosting a visit at uh, at Cornell, Mr. Chairman. Thanks very much. I will just add, and we talked about this earlier, but the pipeline in, in, in schools is important, pipeline through 4-H and FFA and all those other programs are are such um, important as well. Um, next, the chair recognizes the congressman from. Texas, Congressman Jackson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate, appreciate you uh, uh, sweeping me in here right at the end. It looks like I got here seconds before uh, we're done, but thank you. I got four committees, so it's been chaos today, but um, thank you for, thank you our witnesses for being here today. Uh, as you may or may not know, I represent the 13th Congressional District of Texas. It's one of the largest animal agriculture districts in the country. Uh, Texas 13 has more fed cattle than anywhere else in the entire U.S., representing over 16.5 billion in economic value. Uh, the work that you all do in the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service is critical to the overall health of the animal agriculture industry in my district and the rest of the country, and I appreciate it. Uh, under, uh, under Secretary Moffitt, I wanted to ask you, uh, foot uh, and mouth disease is right off the coast of one of our major trading partners right now, Australia, in Indonesia. Uh, African swine fever has been found in the Dominican Republic a mere stone's throw away from Puerto Rico. Your testimony underlines the catastrophic impacts these and other foreign animal diseases would have in the U.S. if and when an outbreak were to occur. Can you speak to the importance of continuing to bolster the National Animal Vaccine and Veterinary Countermeasures Bank in the next Farm Bill, including further funding to meet our ever-growing need in the protecting from uh, foot, mouth and, uh, foot, foot and mouth disease and other foreign animal diseases that we might encounter? Thank you so much for that question. And I'll pass it to Dr. Noggle to talk more about the vaccine bank. Um, and, and all of, and then of course, as you recognize, the preparedness, the response, making sure that we're keeping it out in the first place, but the vaccine bank as, as that, uh, but in, you know, important is biosecurity and stamping out the disease and that vaccine bank as an important insurance tool as well. But I'll pass it to Dr. Noggle to talk about the vaccine bank. Sure, a couple of additional details here. So um, we've purchased over $56 million in vaccine antigen concentrate for FMD and finished vaccine for CSF, which is classical swine fever. Um, also important in the bank is it's a countermeasures bank. 
in addition to a vaccine bank. So we've purchased diagnostic test kits for FMD and ASF, African swine fever, so we can be ready to respond um, you know, as quickly as we detect those diseases. Um, currently, our goal is to have a minimum of 25 million doses available for each of the top 10 strains for FMD, and we're working toward that goal. Um, and uh, so I do think that the bank and having access to those vaccines is critically important from a preparedness perspective. Well, thank you. I agree, sir. And I think that uh, prevention, obviously, is way more cheaper than trying to treat uh, when, once it gets here. I think we all understand that. Uh, Madam Minister Secretary, I was going to ask you one more question. Uh, in your testimony, you mentioned how uh, foreign disease outbreaks highlight the critical need for public sector animal health professionals, especially veterinarians. I just want to point out that in my district, the Texas Tech University School of Veterinary Medicine is specialized in training uh, the types of large rural animal vets that we need so desperately right now in the country. Uh, vets that the USDA needs to maintain the health of America's animal agriculture industry. I'm hopeful that the USDA recognizes the potential of the Texas Tech University School of Veterinary Medicine as a pipeline to, to the talent that they so desperately need when staffing shortages at the agency. Can you please expand on the opportunities that, that, are, you, that are you're taking to recruit and retain talented individuals like the ones I'm describing? Uh, Representative, thank you so much for that question and for highlighting, I think, you know, some of the important uh, part of our pipeline development is, of course, veterinary schools across the country. These are important for us in many ways. I had the opportunity not to visit Texas Tech, but to visit um, another university, another vet school, and to, to meet with students and talk about the opportunities for working at APHIS, at USDA um, as a whole. And I know our team at APHIS, our team at USDA, is constantly reaching out and recruiting students from vet schools across the country. I would imagine including Texas Tech. Um, and I can pass it to Dr. Noggle to talk about some of the scholarship programs, some of the internship programs that we have as well, so that we're not just doing recruitment, but we're also really feeding that pipeline. Thank you. First, I'd say there's a lot of opportunity um, for students who are interested in working for us in Texas, right? We have the cattle fever tick program. We also have the southern border ports that we cover. Um, so these could be veterinarians as well as animal health technicians, really anyone interested in agriculture. Um, within uh, USDA APHIS, uh, we have several internship programs for students, college students, high school students. We also have an internship program that's a scholarship program called the Salty Wilson Scholarship Scholarship, and it allows um, us to provide some funding to help students go to veterinary school in return to coming back to us. And um, we've, we're very well aware of the program at Texas Tech as well as programs with, at Texas A&M. Yep, and we have a component of Texas A&M in my district as well that does the first couple of years of that type of training. It's a phenomenal program as well. Uh, I understand, you know, as a physician, how, you know, uh, the, the money that's out there available to you pick, based on what specialty you pick is going to drive a lot of what you do. I also know uh, my district director and my, uh, and my uh, treasurer for, uh, on, uh, in my district are, are large animal vets, and I, under, I know that, like, a lot of people will, will choose to be small animal vets because that's where the money's at. So anything I think that you can do to, uh, to foster people wanting to go into uh, taking care of our cattle and our large animals and stuff is going to be very beneficial to us all in the long run. Thank you. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, on the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplementary written responses from the witnesses to any question posed by a member. This hearing of the Subcommittee on Livestock, Dairy, and Poultry is adjourned.